The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, inaugurates a special summer series and welcomes as its musical conductor the world's foremost bandmaster, Arthur Pryor. With this famous band, he brings you the first chapter in the origin and development of orchestral and band music. And as the program opens, may we remind you that many of the things that make summer bearable, despite blistering days and nights, have either been created or improved through chemical research. The refrigeration that keeps foods in perfect condition in your home or at the market. The beautiful man-made yarns that go to make many of the new, cooler, summer fabrics for men's and women's clothing. The air conditioning so increasingly in use in private and public buildings everywhere. These are but a few of the many summertime contributions to better things for better living through chemistry. In 1798, Congress authorized a drum major, a fife major, and 32 drums and fifes to play at all governmental functions. This became the nucleus of the oldest organized band in America, the United States Marine Band. On New Year's Day in 1801, it gave its first official concert at the White House and thereby established a custom that continues to this day. In 1888, its most famous bandmaster, John Philip Sousa, wrote one of his most popular marches in honor of the organization, the only musical composition which is officially recognized by the United States government. Arthur Pryor and his band play the official march of the United States Marine Corps, Semper Fidelis. In every city and town of the United States, bands of various descriptions sprung up at an early date. Love of music alone was responsible for their formation, for engagements were few and pay so small that it was necessary for the members to follow other professions and make their music their recreation. These semi-professional musicians did much to foster the spread of good music in America. And there was great interest and excitement in these communities when a famous concert band toured the country and played in their vicinity. The first great traveling concert band in America was directed 
by one of the most picturesque figures in musical history, Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore, affectionately known throughout the country as Pat Gilmore. Gilmore was an outstanding showman as well as a fine musician. At the Great Peace Jubilee in 1872 in Boston, he directed a band of over 1,000 pieces. And as a climax, when playing the anvil chorus from Il Trovatore, 100 red-shirted firemen hammered on 100 anvils to the rhythm of Verdi's music. And for the grand finale, the booms of cannons punctuated the singing of the Star-Spangled Banner. In honor of America's first bandmaster showman, Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore, Arthur Pryor and his band bring us the anvil chorus from Verdi's opera, Il Trovatore. <laughs> Gilmore's lifetime, he became the conductor of the 22nd Regiment Band, and when he died in 1892, his place was taken by one of America's best-beloved composers, Victor Herbert, whose music is equally popular both with bands and orchestras, and whose life story was told in last week's Cavalcade of America. Arthur Pryor and his band play selections from one of Victor Herbert's tuneful operettas, The Red Mill. <laughs> Thank you. 
In the late 80s, in the town of St. Joseph, Missouri, considerable rivalry existed between two bands, Samuel D. Pryor's band and Winkler's Silver Cornet Band, which was also made up from the citizens of the town. Young Arthur Pryor, as a member of his father's organization, learned to play many different instruments, and his experiences with a band at St. Joe are typical of other similar bands throughout the country at this period. For celebrations or parades, both bands were engaged, and when they met, it was always the signal for one to try to outplay the other. Let us turn back to one of those days. Samuel Pryor's band is marching along the principal street on its way to join the procession, and young Arthur Pryor, still in his teens, is talking with the recent recruit. Here comes Winkler's band. As they go by, row your loudest and strongest. If they drown us out, we're disgraced. How do you mean? Well, Winkler boasts that he has more cornets than we have, and that he can drown us out. You know, when you hear another band playing another tune, it's hard to keep in unison. And the band that's still playing in unison after passing the other is the winner. Oh, I see. Well, I'll do my best. There they are. They're, they're, they've started. Pop always waits, and he has a system that helps us win. We can't help hearing the other band. But if you keep an eye on your bass drummer and keep in time with his beat, you can't get mixed up. I see. Here comes Winkler, boys. We'll start General Boulanger March. And don't forget, watch the bass drum. No, 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 no. All right. We've won again, boys. Winkler's whole band has quit except one clarinet, and he's playing our tune. <laughs> this was the situation in many small communities until the coming of such great concert bands as Gilmore's and Sousa's developed a great ambition for proficiency in artistry rather than in volume. Some of the members of these small town bands found their way into the famous organizations. The story of how Arthur Pryor joined Sousa's band is worth telling. One of Gilmore's musicians, Tom Shannon, had heard young Arthur play the trombone with the senior Pryor's band, and he was offered an engagement. On Gilmore's death, Shannon joined Sousa's organization, and at his suggestion, Sousa sent for Pryor. A tall, shy young man arrives in New York and is allowed to rehearse on probation with a great bandmaster. Sousa is just finishing one of his marches. Young Pryor is seated in the trombone section of the band. All right, boys. And now, uh, now we'll try goodbye. Well, here's where you get yours, young fella. You mean me? I sure do. There's a trombone cadenza in this number that's a corker. Well, the boys lost his job last week because of it. I noticed it before we started rehearsing. I think I have it memorized. Never mind memorizing it, just play it. <laughs> if your trombone doesn't fall apart. All right, boys. Ready? All right, A.C., it is where you stand up and play your swan song. <laughs> again. What's the matter? Was it too slow? You heard the boss. Go on. Try it again. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll play it faster. down to the office and sign your contract as first trombone in Sousa's band. A firm foundation with his father's band, followed by nine seasons with Sousa, with whom he soon became assistant conductor, prepared Arthur Pryor to take his place among the great band masters in the cavalcade of America. And it also enabled him to study new and colorful styles of band arrangement and composition. One which he wrote in memory of a little dog he owned when a boy, a dog that wasn't responsive to the spoken word, but who never failed to answer a whistle, is probably his most popular work. He'll play it now, The Whistler and His Dog. 
think of band music as a succession of lusty marches. But such men as Gilmore, Sousa, and Pryor, with their great concert organizations, have proved that band music is capable of delicate and colorful shading equal to that of a string orchestra. Here's an example. Arthur Pryor and his band will bring us Johann Strauss's lovely waltz, The Beautiful Blue Danube.
as small town organizations encourage the visits of the big concert bands, so in turn the big bands encourage the formation and improvement of more small bands. Until today, there is hardly a high school in the country that doesn't have its own band. Thousands of people attend park concerts, and millions more enjoy their band music over the radio. As a tribute to the ability of American bands and their success in bringing the great classics to the music-loving public, Arthur Pryor's band plays the stirring Ride of the Valkyries by Richard Wagner. Let's take a quick make-believe trip to Dallas, Texas. Hurry on out to the Texas Centennial Grounds and walk into the cool, air-conditioned DuPont exhibit, The Wonder World of Chemistry. What's this? Why, coal tar, it says. What's it for? Uh, Wait, that young fellow's going to tell us something. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Out of this sticky black substance, coal tar, chemistry produces aromatic bases for perfumes and for the scents used in soaps and cosmetics. 
Now, if any of you ladies wish to dip your handkerchiefs into this fountain of perfume made with the aid of coal tar, you're welcome to do so. You will find the fragrance of your favorite flower. Hmm. If I didn't smell it with my own nose, I wouldn't believe it. Yes, perfumes from coal tar. Surely a striking example of the wonders that chemical research can perform. These aromatic bases not only find use in perfumes for my lady and as scents for cosmetics and soaps, but they are also important to industry. There are many manufactured products which in themselves possess a disagreeable odor. By adding a small amount of an aromatic compound, these products take on a pleasant odor, thus making them more convenient to use and easier to sell. And so because they affect so many things with which all of us come in daily contact, the aromatic bases that spring from humble coal tar offer additional evidence of the truth expressed in the DuPont phrase, better things for better living through chemistry. same time, Arthur Pryor and his band will again be heard when DuPont continues with its summer series of the Cavalcade of America. Columbia Broadcasting System.